get linked in with the business of Christmas. If this is your first time here, let me give just a quick review. Uh, this whole year, we have been doing a theme called Faith Book, God's Social Network. So the God's put us in these social networks, and that's kind of what we're looking at through Advent, but we're also looking at kind of as the hook, the way to look at these things, uh, some of the different social networks that are out there. Um, and last week we used Twitter, and this week is LinkedIn, and it is for people who are in business. How many of you have a LinkedIn account online? Okay, see that? About a dozen people raised their hand. Um, and so uh, I have one. Sometimes I wonder why. Uh, because generally it's for uh, people who want to hire somebody or who are looking to be hired. But that's not all it's for. In fact, I belong to some groups uh, with preachers and there are discussion forums and those kinds of things. So LinkedIn, uh, when you have a LinkedIn account, you create a business profile. You invite other business people who you know or who are in the same kind of business as you to join you. And then you list your education. And I realized as I was getting ready to preach this sermon that, that I should look at my LinkedIn account. And when I went on there, I realized I hadn't put a lot of things on my profile. Uh, and so I went ahead and did some of that. I put in some of my education. You put in your experience. You put in any awards maybe that you earned or won during your um, career. Um, any specific projects that you worked on that somebody out there might be looking for a person just like you and your skill sets. And so this is how they can find you. Um, and or you may be looking for a job. And, and so that puts your information out there. The interesting thing about LinkedIn as opposed to a resume, when you hand somebody a resume or send it to them, it has all kinds of information about you from your point of view and no one else's. You put your best foot forward, you tell them everything about yourself, but that's all they get. Now you put references down there, and then that's up to the employer to look at those or not. But on LinkedIn, other people do something called endorse you. So if you go on my LinkedIn account, You'll see that I'm endorsed for preaching, for biblical studies, for theology, and for similar things like that. So that people who know me, who are on LinkedIn, have gone onto my thing and have endorsed me uh, in those areas. So if somebody's looking for somebody with some biblical study knowledge, uh, that I would maybe come up in their search. That's kind of how it looks. So uh, it's important on LinkedIn to be endorsed by other people. Well, today, we're going to go on LinkedIn to hire somebody. Somebody who will meet the following four job characteristics that you would want uh, to have for the, for the hire that you're looking for, okay? And so here are those four job characteristics we're going to look for. We're going to look for a person of nobility. Now, that might be somebody like a duke or an earl or a king, now, I don't know how many dukes or earls or kings there are or princesses on LinkedIn. I'm guessing there are not many, but there are some, I'm sure. So we're going to look for a person who has the characteristic of nobility. And we're going to look for somebody who has the characteristic of wisdom. Wouldn't you want somebody working for you who has <coughs> wisdom? Absolutely. We're going to look for a person of spirit. That's something you can't put in a resume, but on LinkedIn that might be able to be worked out somehow. So we're going to look for a person of spirit. And finally, we're going to look for a person of vision. Vision simply is seeing a preferred future. Now, if you have somebody coming to work for you, particularly if it's at a management level or an upper level, you want people who see a preferred future, a better future than what your company now has, right? So we're going to look for somebody who is a person of nobility, of wisdom, of spirit, and of vision uh, on the LinkedIn account. So first, let's go with the very first one. A person of nobility. I don't know how many people you know who are in your life who are people of nobility. But we're going to look specifically today at a king. And there's a lot about him we don't think about as being very noble. His name is Herod. In fact... He's known as Herod the Great. The reason he's known as Herod the Great is because of the great and wonderful things he did. I mean, he built roads, he built palaces, he built fortresses, 
He built all kinds of public buildings. He built amazing things. He brought great prosperity to the land of Israel. Herod was truly great. Herod was a Roman appointed king of Judea. You can see Judea on the map there. You have Galilee up in the top. And you have Judea down at the bottom. And you have Samaria in the middle, right? And so, again, Herod is this Roman appointed king of Judea. He's not elected. He is appointed. And he serves as king from 37 to 4 B.C. Now, we know that Herod is king when Jesus is born. But he only was king until 4 B.C., so how could that be? Well, because when the calendar was started retroactively, it was done incorrectly, and Jesus was born probably somewhere between 4 and 6 B.C., okay? So, again, Herod serves as king of Judea until 4 B.C. The New Testament, though, doesn't really see Herod as very noble. The New Testament sees him as a tyrant into whose kingdom Jesus is born. Herod's father, Herod, he has uncles who are Herod, he has all kinds of people in his family who are Herod. Um, his father, Herod Antipater, met Mark Antony and became lifelong friends with him. Julius Caesar um, favored the Herod family. In fact, he appointed Antipater procurator of Judea in 47 B.C., and conferred on him Roman citizenship, even though he wasn't Roman. That was an honor that descended to his children. And so Herod the Great made his political debut in the same year when his father appointed him governor of Galilee. So you see Galilee up there. Six years later, Mark Antony made him tetriarch at the higher level of Galilee. And in the year 37 BC, at the age of 36, Herod the Great became the unchallenged ruler and king of Judea. Herod had quite a resume on his LinkedIn account for being involved in the Christmas event. Let's look at it. Matthew chapter 2, verses 1 through 8. After Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea. So you see where Bethlehem is located there? About five miles south of Jerusalem, both in the land of Judea. During the time of King Herod, Magi from the east came to Jerusalem and asked, Where is the one who has been born King of the Jews? We saw his star in the east and have come to worship him. When King Herod heard, that, when King Herod heard this, he was disturbed in more ways than one. And all Jerusalem with him. So he wasn't the only one disturbed about this. Jerusalem was hearing about it and were quite disturbed. When he called together all the chief priests and teachers of the law, he asked them, where is the Christ to be born? In Bethlehem in Judea. For this is what the prophet has written. But you, Bethlehem, and the land of Judah are by no means least among the rulers of Judah. For out of you will come a ruler who will be the shepherd of my people, Israel. Then Herod called the Magi secretly and found out from them the exact time the star appeared. And he sent them to Bethlehem and said, Go. Make a careful search for the child. As soon as you find him, report to me so that I may go and worship him too. Herod found out where the infant king was to be born. And he lied to the Magi about what he wanted. And so, you see, this became a business thing for Herod. Herod all of a sudden was gripped with fear that some king was going to be born and would eventually grow up and take over his rule. You see, Herod really did do some great things in his younger reigning. But those last years, he killed many people, many people in his own family, many people, um, even his own wife. Uh, he became this horrible, awful, evil person. And so when he heard about this baby king, he hired, basically, he, he took the LinkedIn profile of these wise men, and he said, look, I need you to do something for me. Since you come here to me, searching for this new king. I'm so glad you've come. I want you to do some work for me. I want you to go to Bethlehem. Your star will be there, I'm sure. And you'll find that if you're king. And when you do, come back and report to me so that I can go and worship him too. Now, of course, Herod didn't want to go and worship him. Herod wanted to get rid of him. So 
Herod is so much a part of this story. And it's interesting, you know, when Mike talked about the, all these people in the story who know who Jesus is, on some level, even Herod knew. I mean, if Herod thought that this was just fable and didn't care about it, I mean, these guys are seeing stars. I mean, today, how many of you would put stock in these wise men? I wouldn't. I mean, do you read your astrological charts? Do you know that on Tuesday you're going to be blessed with some, uh, I don't know, great fortune? Because it says that in the newspaper because of the time you were born, because the stars are... Well, no, we think that's bunk, and, and we put no weight in that at all, because we, we know it is bunk, right? So, if it were today, we wouldn't think much about these wise men, these astrologers. Because it just doesn't make sense, but somehow, they knew. And we'll talk about them a little bit more in a minute. Uh, Matthew 2, verse 16 says this. When Herod realized that he'd been outwitted by the Magi, so see, the Magi had gone, they found the baby Jesus, uh, they worshipped him, did all that, but they were warned in a dream not to go back to Herod. So when Herod found that out, realized he'd been outwitted, he was furious, he gave orders to kill all the baby boys in Bethlehem and its vicinity, who were two years old and under, in accordance with the time he had learned from the Magi, so what do we learn from this? We learn that Jesus, by the time the Magi came, um, Jesus would have no longer been in the stable area. He would have been in a home by this point, staying with extended family or people they found that they could stay with. Um, and he kills all babies two years old and younger according to the time that the Magi said. He said, when did this star appear to you? When did you start coming here? Well, we don't know that they said two years. He could have said six months. He could have said six weeks. He, he could have said two years. We don't know, but somewhere from zero to two years is the time that they said. And Herod, knowing that maybe his soldiers aren't quite the sharpest, he wanted to make sure this infant king was killed. So he said, anything that looks like a male baby, right? Any, any child two years old and younger who is male, and not only in Bethlehem. Did you notice that? In Bethlehem and the vicinity. So this was bigger than we usually think of. Every male child. Now, who did the killing? Well, it would have been the soldiers in the military, right? That Herod sent out. And I've always pictured that as soldiers coming from Jerusalem, marching down to Bethlehem, and killing all the babies. But then I realized, well, no, he had soldiers all over the land. So very likely they would have been ones who were in Bethlehem, who knew the people who had babies, in fact, would have known the people. Very likely. Can you imagine somebody you know who's been there, who's been the protector of your city, comes down to your home and grabs your infant male child and takes him out and slaughters him? Why? Because such great insecurity, such fear for Herod. And Herod's just taking care of business. He's just taking care of business in the most vile, horrible way. The scripture goes on. Then what was said through the prophet Jeremiah was fulfilled. A voice is heard in Ramah. Weeping in great mourning, Rachel weeping for her children and refusing to be comforted because they are no more. How many times have you read that or heard that and you go, huh? What is that about? Who is Rachel? Do you remember that um, Jacob loved Rachel and wanted to marry her, but he, was, he worked for seven years for his father-in-law and was going to get to marry her, but he tricked her and made her marry that older sister first, then he had to work another seven years and got to marry um, Rachel sometime in there, and they're married. But she doesn't have any children. Her sister has children. Her sister's sort of midwife or, or helper has children. Rachel's helper has children, but there are ten sons born. And then finally, Rachel becomes pregnant, and she gives birth to Joseph. And then she gives birth to a second son whose name is Benjamin, and do you know where she was when she gave birth? They were traveling at the time. Kind of like Mary and Joseph. They were traveling at the time. And Rachel gave birth to Benjamin near Bethlehem. And instead of sending her body back to home, they decided to create a tomb for her just outside Bethlehem. And that tomb is still there to this day. And that's what this scripture is about. A voice is heard in Ramah weeping and great mourning. Rachel 
Think about Rachel weeping. Rachel weeping for her children. Refusing to be comforted. Because they are no more. Weeping for these children who are no more. Herod, after Herod died, because Joseph and Mary, being warned in a dream, took Jesus to Egypt to get away. And that's why Jesus wasn't killed during this. But after Herod died, an angel of the Lord appeared in a dream to Joseph in Egypt and said, Get up, take the child and his mother, go to the land of Israel for those who were trying to take the child's life or dead. Now, if you weren't here last week, you're going, What in the world? We've got a couple more weeks before Christmas and we're already after Christmas. That's right. I told you last week, we started before Christmas with Zechariah and Elizabeth, and that today we get to after Christmas. Then we're going to back up and we're going to put the good sandwich stuff right in the middle. Uh, uh, over the next couple of weeks. But we are looking at the after the, the birth events. Herod was linked in to the Christmas event. He was told a new king was born, and because of his insecurities, had all the male babies in Bethlehem killed. It was strictly a business move on Herod's part. He did not want a rival for his throne, so he unsuccessfully attempted to get rid of him. So, in an odd way, that's looking at a person of nobility. Sometimes you are given it, sometimes you're born into it, sometimes you acquire it. He was given it, and he squandered it. Uh, so now we're going to look for a person of wisdom. Um, let me, I just don't know why, I feel like I'm far away from you today. Uh, let me come down here. So we're going to look for a person of wisdom as we're seeking somebody through our LinkedIn process. And there are what we call three wise men, or three kings, as Mike alluded to. Uh, we don't know that they were kings. We do know that they had some wisdom, that they knew something that others didn't know. The wise men came very likely either from what we know as Iran or Iraq, Saudi Arabia, or the Yemen. And although they're often called kings, it's very likely they're not kings, except in Yemen at that time, there were some Jewish uh, kings. And there's, so there's a slight possibility, but likely none. Now, how many of them were there? We say three. Why? Because there was three gifts, right? Well, if you're a husband and wife and you go to somebody's home, how many gifts do you give them? Well, you give them maybe one gift, right? But that's from two people. <laughs> Or you might, as a group, you might give a gift to somebody. So it could have only been two. It could have been 12. We really don't know how many wise men there were. And it probably would have been just the astrologers. There would have been other people with them. Uh, so it was probably a you know, small group of people who had come. Uh, they were definitely men of learning. The word magi comes from the Greek word magos, where the English word magic comes from. Magos itself comes from the old Persian word, word Magupati. Sounds like what my son used to say when he was little. Magupati? <laughs> Today, we call them astrologers. The Magi would have followed the pattern of the stars religiously. They had seen an unusual star in the sky, and they knew that it told of the birth of a special king. No one really knows what star they saw. Many theories include comets, supernovas, conjunction of the planets or something simply supernatural where that star was put there and then taken away. We don't know. All we know is that there was something in the sky, some form of star that they saw, that they believed, told of the birth of a king. And they believed it so much that they traveled a great distance that they went to another king for information, thinking that he would be excited about the birth of this infant king and followed it to this little town south of Jerusalem and sure enough found exactly what they were looking for, the infant king. When the wise men found Mary and Joseph and the baby Jesus, they're now in this house, they bring them three gifts, gold, frankincense, and myrrh. Think about it. Gold is associated with what? Nobility, with kings. Frankincense is sometimes used in worship, incense, to lift up prayers to God. Myrrh is a kind of a perfume that is often used in part of the embalming process to make the body smell okay for a little while. 
So think about those three gifts for this infant king. He is the king, he is to be worshipped, and one day his body will need to be prepared for burial. The wise men based their belief about this king from a star. They did it somehow knowing, just knowing. I, you know, I, I wonder about that, about this whole idea of revelation. Do you ever have revelation? Do you ever have things that you just know? That you, nobody told you, you just know them. Uh, things that you are sure that God has revealed to you. Do you have things about it? Well, one of those things would be your salvation. That God at some point just makes that clear to you, right? So we, most of us have that in common. Um, I had a thing that was revealed to me. Uh, I've shared it before. Um, that God told me that I was to marry Kim Gamble. Now, Kim and I had not seen each other for some time. Kim and I had never dated. Kim and I went to different colleges. We knew each other during our high school years because we were on a youth a state thing together, um, and we were good friends, but uh, I hadn't seen her, hadn't talked to her, didn't know if she was dating anybody, and God revealed it to me that I was supposed to marry her, and so I called her home, she lived about an hour away from me, and her mother said she was at a camp about an hour and a half away, and I got in a car, and I drove up there, and I found her, and she was glad to see me, and I sat her down, I said, Kim, God has told me we are going to get married. <laughs> That's right, that's exactly what she did. <laughs> a few months later, she was wondering if I was going to call her. Because she did laugh at me, and she thought it was absurd, and yeah, Jeff, right, I've always thought you're a little wacky. But I'm telling you, I was absolutely 100% sure. God had revealed that to me. So I wasn't daunted by the fact that she didn't know about this last relationship that ended, and all these stuff that went on. And uh, the night that she was wondering if I was going to call her, I called her. We went out on about five dates, um, and I asked her to marry me, and she said, hmm, I don't know. <laughs> I had to wait five days. God apparently had not revealed it to her like he had revealed it to me. Sometimes you have to wait. Even when God reveals something to you, a preferred future, sometimes you have to wait for it to come true. And these next people we're going to look at had been waiting. Had been waiting for their preferred future. And so we've looked at the person of nobility, we've looked at these people of wisdom, and now we're going to look for a person of spirit. Now we're really jumping to the end of the story. We're, we're kind of jumping over... Um, Somebody else we're going to come back to. Person of spirit. Luke chapter 2, verse 21. On the eighth day, when it was time to circumcise Jesus, Joseph and Mary took him to Jerusalem to present him to the Lord, to offer a sacrifice in keeping with what is said in the law of the Lord. And then verse 36. There was a prophetess named Anna. She was very old. She had lived with her husband seven years. After, seven years after her marriage. And then was a widow until she was 84. So let's assume that day she was married at age 18, and at age 25, her husband died, seven years later. And then from 25 to 84, which is this many years. Anybody? How many? 59, thank you very much. I'll just take it. Um, uh, for 59 years, here's what it says about her. She never left the temple, but worshipped night and day, fasting and praying. She is this prophetess. She was in the temple for 59 years. She knew everybody who came in there. Everybody knew her. She worshipped the Lord. I mean, this is the nun of nuns. I mean, she that's her whole life, once her husband died, is simply being in the temple and praising God and worshipping Him and prophesying in the name of God. So you can picture this beautiful, kind of great-grandmotherly type, uh, who uh, apparently, you know, as far as we can tell, had no children of her own. We don't know that for sure, but the fact that seven years after being married, she spends all of her time worshiping in the temple, she probably doesn't have any children of her own. She never left the temple to worship night and day, fasting and praying. 
coming up to Mary and Joseph. Mary and Joseph had come into the temple to bring Jesus, to have him circumcised, to offer sacrifice. She came up to Mary and Joseph. She gave thanks to God and spoke about the child to all who were looking forward to the redemption of Israel. Now, imagine this great-grandmother who tied with this baby in her arms, walking around. Somebody you know who you've seen there many times. And she says, hey, this is the redemption of Israel. Look right here. I have the redemption of Israel in my arms. I know that is who this is. Why would she know that? Why would she know that this is the Christ, the anointed one, the Messiah, the redemption of Israel? I don't know, except that it was revealed to her. And she knew it. Okay, let's see where we are. Herod was linked in, but not endorsed. Right? The wise men were linked in and endorsed as wise and generous. Anna was linked in and endorsed as prophetic and spiritual. But none were more linked into the Christmas story and to our story than the person named Simeon. And this is the fourth characteristic we're looking for, is the characteristic a vision. Simeon is truly linked in. Here's his part of the story, Luke 2, 25. Now there was a man in Jerusalem called Simeon, who was righteous and devout. He was waiting for the consolation of Israel, and the Holy Spirit was upon him. It had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he would not die before he had seen the Lord's Christ. Moved by the Spirit, he went into the temple courts. Now, let's Think for a moment what we know about Simeon. We know that he's older. We know that he's present when Jesus comes in or goes when Jesus is there. What we don't know is if this is a business thing going on with him or not. It, it doesn't say he's a priest. We've kind of always assumed that about him, but it doesn't say that. He could just be a person, a worshiper of God who is in the temple area. The Holy Spirit revealed to him that he would see the long-awaited Messiah before he died. In the Christmas story, we see that Simeon comes to Mary and Joseph and takes the little baby from them. Moved by the Spirit, he went to the temple courts when the parents brought in the child Jesus to do for him what was the custom of the law. Simeon took him in his arms and praised God, saying, Sovereign Lord, as you have promised, you may now dismiss your servant in peace. I can die now. For my eyes have seen your salvation, which you prepared in the sight of all people, a light for revelation to the Gentiles and for glory to your people Israel. Simeon sees things that others would never see. He even sees the Gentiles in what's going on here in this little baby in his arms. The child's mother marveled at what was said about him, her mother and father. Then Simeon blessed them. Isn't that cool? Doesn't say he blessed the child. This wasn't a child dedication. Simeon blessed the parents, and then he says to Mary, his mother, listen to what he says. This child is destined to cause the falling and rising of many in Israel, to be a sign that was spoken against, so that the thoughts of many hearts will be revealed, and a sword will pierce your own soul, soul too. Now, who did Simeon say that to? To Mary. Not to Joseph. Mary and Joseph were there, and he came up to Mary and Joseph, and he took the baby Jesus, and he, he talked about this preferred future, and then he turns just to Mary. Why is that? Why did he leave Joseph out? Wouldn't that seem kind of rude that he would leave the father out of what he's going to say? What did he say just to Mary that Joseph could also hear? This child is destined to cause the falling and rising of many in Israel. And we know that's true about Jesus, right? And to be a sign that will be spoken against. Boy, will he. So that the thoughts of many hearts will be revealed. Yes, they will. And then here's the part that I believe is the reason why the author. That, and I just love so much God's word. I, I don't know if you see these things like I do. But these little things just confirm that this is from God. That these words are not something that somebody just put down on paper. Uh, otherwise, it, it didn't even have to be interrupted to say, he's now saying this to Mary. It could have just been in that part where he takes the child and says it in front of Mary and Joseph. 
But the fact that he says this is, this is being spoken by Simeon to Mary, listen to the last part, and a sword will pierce your own soul too. Obviously at Jesus' death, right? So why isn't it said to Joseph? Why? Because Joseph is going to be dead by the time Jesus is crucified. So already God knows and God inspires the writing of this to say these words are just for Mary that a sword will pierce your own soul too. When does that happen? Joseph is gone by that point. So these words are just for Mary. When does it happen for Mary? When Jesus is on the cross, he's been crucified. And what do they do to make sure that they die? They break their legs and they broke the legs of the two thieves, but not Jesus because Jesus was already dead. So what did they do to Jesus instead just to make sure they pierced his side? And blood and water flowed out. And in that moment, Mary's words that she heard became so true that her soul was pierced at the very same moment. I'm sure that Mary and Joseph were shocked at first when they heard these words coming from Simeon. Or were they? In verse 30, Simeon says, For my eyes have seen your salvation. What was it his eyes saw? Just a little baby boy with five small toes on each foot, five little fingers on each hand. But when Simeon looks at the baby Jesus, he obviously sees much more than a little baby. My eyes have seen your salvation. The word see is important. It means to perceive, to know, to understand. The Holy Spirit of God moves Simeon to go into the temple at that very moment to see Joseph and Mary and the baby. And to pick that baby up filled with the Holy Spirit, Simeon sees that Jesus is the fulfillment of Old Testament prophecies. That Jesus is the promised Messiah. That Jesus is the Emmanuel, the God with us. That he is the wonderful counselor, the mighty God, the everlasting father, the prince of peace. That he was foretold centuries earlier by the prophet Isaiah. Simeon miraculously sees with his own eyes what God's people have been waiting centuries to see. And what Simeon himself had waited a lifetime to see. But Simeon sees even more. He sees the wonderful miracles that Jesus will be doing. He sees that Jesus will heal the blind, the lame, the sick, the lepers. Simeon sees that Jesus will even raise the dead to life. Simeon hears the wonderful news that Jesus will be bringing. Good news of God's love and forgiveness to the poor, the prisoners, the outcasts of society. Simeon sees the love that Jesus will show to people like Zacchaeus, Mary, Martha, Lazarus, Roman centurion, prostitutes, woman caught in the act of adultery, to you and to me. Simeon sees still more. Filled with the Holy Spirit, Simeon sees the cross and the grave and Jesus' resurrection on the first Easter. Simeon sees that Jesus is the suffering servant who would die for our sins as anticipated by the prophets. He sees in this baby that one day he would be despised and rejected by men. A man of sorrows and familiar with grief, as Isaiah foretold centuries earlier. Simeon sees that Jesus will be hated. Simeon sees that Jesus is the salvation which you have prepared in the sight of all the people. Simeon sees that the baby Jesus will be the Savior for those from every tribe and nation and language and people who also long for God. Simeon saw a world not unlike our own, a world full of war and terror, of death, of poverty, where children kill and are killed. Simeon saw a world desperate with hurt and pain and immorality. He sees the terrible tragedies that come from violence, illness, earthquakes, tornadoes, tsunamis, hurricanes. As Simeon sees the baby Jesus, he's ready to meet God. His maker can go ahead and take him. Because he can die in peace. Why? Because Simeon not only sees, but also believes. He believes Jesus is the Savior. He believes that Jesus is the Messiah. He believes that this little baby is the very Son of God. So, can we say today with Simeon, I can die in peace, for my eyes have seen your salvation. You don't have to be holding the baby Jesus in your arms to say that. You just have to hold Jesus in your heart by faith. You just have to receive Jesus as Lord and Savior of your life. And as Simeon teaches us, you're never too old. You're never too young to see God's salvation. 
Herod, Anna, the wise men are all part of the Christmas story because of their particular business in life. But Simeon may not have had any business being in the story. Yet he, more than anyone else, was truly linked in. How about you? You had no business being there. In fact, it was 2,000 years ago that it took place. But like Simeon, I ask, are you linked into the Christmas story? Have you seen the salvation of your soul? Are you holding Jesus close and telling others the good news? If so, I would agree that you are very linked in, and God is happy to endorse you as a person of nobility, a child of the king, to endorse you as a person of wisdom, wise in knowing your need for a savior. That God would endorse you as a person of spirit, having put your trust in Jesus and been born of the Holy Spirit, and that God would endorse you as a person of vision, seeing God high and lifted up, bringing salvation to the world as much today as Simeon saw in his day. Are you linked in to Jesus? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, it, it was business decisions for Herod. Bad business decisions. It was the business of the wise men to follow that star because that's what they did. They looked at the stars and they read them and they understood certain things from them. And for all of the disbelief we have in that, Lord, in this case, we believe. We believe that you made them know. And whatever it was, the star... We believe that you made that happen at that particular time so that they would know. You used that to reveal it to them. You used angels to reveal it to the shepherds. And God, we don't know beyond direct revelation what you did for Anna, who saw the redemption of Israel, for Simeon, who saw the salvation of the Lord. Father, we would pray for that same Holy Spirit revelation. That there wouldn't be anybody who would walk out of this place today, God, who hasn't put their trust and faith in you, who hasn't come to a saving knowledge of Jesus the Christ, no longer the infant, but still the king. In fact, the king of kings, the eternal king, the king of the kingdom that will come and is here. Even in this moment, your kingdom reigns. There are a lot of Herods, Lord. There's even a Herod in each one of us that would try to stop your kingdom from reigning in our own lives and the lives of those around us. God, we pray that Herod would be removed, that he would be dethroned, that he would have no part in us, but that only Jesus would reign, that we'd put him on the throne of our lives and allow him to reign supremely and to guide us in all his ways, holy and perfect, knowing, God, that we are failures, but through him we are successful. We are absolutely linked in because of what he has done and we put our trust and our faith in that alone. And God, I pray that nobody else walks out of here without knowing that because they hold Christ in their hearts, they ought to go like Simeon did, like Anna did, like the wise men did, like the shepherds did, and tell others the good news that Jesus is Lord. And he has come to us. And we pray in his name. Amen. If you have come to know Jesus during this hour, we invite you to walk right over to our prayer room as we sing. A prayer team member will be there and would love to pray with you. Be certain in your heart for you to know that Christ is real to you. Uh, if you have any need, any prayer need, or you want to pray especially for some of these people we talked about, for Amber or Mike or Lynn, and you'd like to join others in the prayer room and to, to say special prayer for them today. I'd invite you to go there as we sing as well. If you want to go, just praise God. Spend some time in worship and kneel before the, the cross in there. It's a beautiful place to pray and worship. Please go as we sing. We just respond as God calls you.
playing. Um, I'd like to, uh, Ann, are you, Ann and Barbara, would you go into the prayer room, please? Um, is Doris back there? Doris, would you go over to the prayer room as well, please? Representing Lynn, and you guys representing Mike and Tammy, would you go over there representing your daughter? Those are the three people we ask for prayer. And would a few others of you go now and pray with them for their loved ones? Just whoever would like to go and pray uh, while we're singing. There's just some great needs going on in their lives. Uh, I just want you to surround them and be in prayer for them as we continue to sing.